Okay, we're continuing the uh, War for America tutorial, part 7. We're still in the year 1777, only this time we're doing the late spring turn. Now I'm trying something a bit different uh, for this video. I'm trying uh, changing technical equipment, you might say. So I'm now shooting this with my iPad mini, and we'll see if we can solve that uh, focus problem. So let's continue on. Okay, we've checked the reinforcements, and there are no reinforcements for the rest of 1777. So we're rolling for initiative. And the Colonials will be going first. First action pulse, Colonials. Now the Americans don't really have to take a lot of chances. It's really the British that have to do so. Because Americans can sit back and wait for an opportunity and just wait for the French to come in eventually in 1778. So the initiative or the onus of a burden of attack is on the British. So Washington doesn't have to take any real big chances. There's still the Royal Army at New York. Schuyler should gather up all these Continentals here. And of course we still have this little mini campaign in the south with Charles Lee and Clinton. So for now, I think we'll have Schuyler gather up all these Continentals near uh, Philadelphia. Roll for Schuyler's initiative. And he gets a two, so he can gather in those Continentals. Too bad he wasn't centrally located with these. He could um, use a muster action and pull them in. But, he's got three Continentals with him. He'll uh, just travel with one. Go down and go one, two, three, four. Gather up another little wee large Continental Army there. And that's Schuyler's move. Now to the British. Overall, it just doesn't look good for the British. They're stymied. Their momentum has been lost. Burgoyne is not really large enough to take on Gates now unless he pulls up St. Leisure. Even then, it's pretty darn even. The Royal Army in New York is not doing a darn thing. We have a large force over at Newport, which isn't doing much either. Poor old Clinton is kind of stalemated against Charles Lee. So the British have got to do something drastic to get this campaign going. And I'm wondering now if they shouldn't even wake up the Indian nations to just divert uh, attention for the colonials, or Americans as I, should, as I should be calling them. I just feel that British have got to do something drastic, something radical, because they're deadlocked everywhere. I may regret this, but I think we're going to do a C move. Cornwallis is going to move by C, always keeping in mind the transport capacity now. 1777 is 10. He'll probably use a good portion of that capacity, maybe all of it. He's got seven, he's got eight factors. I think that's what we're going to do. Cornwallis is going to move by sea. Now where to? The south for sure, but where in the south? Should he land at Wilmington? Sounds logical. He'd be able to activate this whole force. I think that's what we're going to do. Now, remember sea moves don't even count as your main action pulse. So we'll roll for Cornwallis. He must state his objective. He's going to move by C to Wilmington. We roll the die and see how many moving points he gets. He uh, will go with Howe's fleet too, of course. So away we go. Roll the die. Wow. There's the evidence. The weather has just not been kind for the British. They have one single moving point.
Now, because he got an absolutely crap roll, we have to put a little reminder here that he's uh, embarked because it costs you one movement point to embark. So you won't have to pay that again. So even the weather is against the British in this campaign. So we're going to be going for the next action pulse. We'll pull, see who moves first. And it's a tie. Well, lo and behold, that means each player is going to be drawing a card, but that's bad for the British, which means that there's only going to be one action pulse left, and the entire late spring turn will be over. Let's draw those cards first. Let's see what they get. Keeping in mind that we're always trying to simulate a two-player game, the British have these two cards in their hand, and the Americans have these two. Now, the British player does not know that the American player has this card, which is Storms at Sea, which is deadly against a naval uh, move. But the British had crap luck anyway with a one, and they're going to get crap luck again when the Americans pull this on them. Remember, the British don't know that the Americans have this card. So each side is drawing a card. Draw one for the British. And they get... Uh-huh. Slave Uprising in the Deep South. That could be handy. And the Americans get a Winter Quarters card, which is good for both parties, actually. So they've got their hand full. And we take the last initiative of the turn. However, we don't roll, because the last person to have the initiative first was the Americans. So the Americans will move, then the British will move, and the entire turn will be over. Short turns are not good for the British. So the Colonials will move. I think Charles Lee will just entrench at Hillsborough because he knows that Clinton is eventually getting down there and he might as well prepare for it. He rolls for his initiative, gets a three, easily makes his initiative, and then entrenches Hillsborough. That leaves the last action pulse of the entire turn to the British. Which reminds me, I was so occupied with Clinton's turn, I didn't even move the British action pulse. But I don't think I would have done much anyway. So stimmied. Anyway, it's their turn now. And we know that Cornwallis's move is free, and he's going to move by sea. Now this is where the Americans might want to use this Storms at Sea. So they pull the Storms at Sea card against Cornwallis, which means when he rolls for his sea movement, he'll have negative two to the dice. Good play of a card there. Cornwallis needs a six bad. Well, not bad. He gets a five. So he really has three movement points. So that storm at sea did do something. So let's move him. He moves out to the New England blockade box for one down to the middle states for two, and into the tidewater box for three. A long voyage to get to Wilmington. We can take that embarked marker off now. Okay, well, it's just disgraceful that Burgoyne hasn't done a darn thing with his small Canada army there. So, let's move Barry St. Leisure to join Burgoyne. So he will roll his initiative, gets six, and he does not get his initiative, which means he has a movement factor of two. But in this case, it actually doesn't matter much, because he'll move two by water, one, two, and if you move entirely by water, you get a bonus, so three. He actually is now joined with Burgoyne's force at Ticonderoga. Okay, that ends the late spring turn of 1777. We're now into the early summer of 1777. Time is going by quickly for the British, which is not a good thing for them. They need time, and they just don't have it. So, it's now early summer, and we're going to roll for the first initiative to see who moves first. Initiative. 
the British move first. Oh, thank goodness for that. So we move the action pulse down marker one, put everything up to date, and the British will now take the first action pulse. Always a good idea to move your forces at sea first. And you remember the destination of Cornwallis was Wilmington. So Cornwallis will roll for his naval move. And he gets five, which is plenty. Which means he can go one to the deep south blockade box, two into Wilmington. Now remember, he has a moving point left should he decide to move inland. And I think he will. I think he will. He's not that afraid of Mr. Charles Lee. So he goes in with eight combat factors and he'll move into Cross Creek here. So now we've got two British armies confronting Lee, which changes the complexion of things. Now all that was the free naval move. The British still have yet to move. And maybe it's time for Mr. Burgoyne to try his chances against Gates. So I don't like it, but what are you going to do? Burgoyne is going to move against Gates. He has to leave something at Ticonderoga, so he'll leave a small garrison there. Let's see if he gets his initiative. He does. So I'll do that. Burgoyne will move directly on Gates. Okay, Burgoyne is at Fort Edward attacking Gates. Does Gates want to fight? Probably. We'll do the math and let's see how this battle goes. Okay, doing the math, this is what we have. Now, if Burgoyne ever needed to win a battle, it's this one. Both are going to be on the same table. Gates has two of his factors doubled, remember, because of the fort. So, he's on the 9 table, or 9, 8 to 14 table, and so is Burgoyne. The difference is Gates is adding 4 to his dice, Burgoyne is adding 5. Now, this is where a battle card would come in mighty handy for the British, but they don't have one. The Americans don't really have any defensive cards, so we're going to straight die roll the battle at Fort Edward. Rolling the die, and Burgoyne needs a win here. Let's see what happens. I don't think so. If he did win, it's going to be by a mighty small margin. No, I doubt it. Okay, so the Americans have a base uh, 8 plus 4 is 12. So they've inflicted a 2 2 star on Burgoyne. Burgoyne has rolled a base 6, but he's adding uh, 5. He's rolled an 11, 1 2 star. So Gates does defeat Burgoyne. Poor old Burgoyne. He loses 2, Gates loses 1. And that's the situation after the battle. Burgoyne's going to have a D marker on him, and he's retreating to Ticonderoga. It's like the fates are against the British in this campaign. Let's put them back on the board, and then the colonial turn. Now this seems like it would be a good opportunity for Gates to counterattack, but we have to remember that two of those factors of his were doubled in a fort, and if he attacked Ticonderoga, although Burgoyne does have a D marker on him, Assaulting uh, Ticonderoga is negative three to the dice, so why should the Americans throw away lives just to try and uh, defeat Burgoyne and lose another step? A uh, little point to that. I think things are going to come to a showdown here in the south, and I can't think of any more secure position than what Charles Lee is in. Unless Cornwallis and Clinton work together to try and surround him. So, the British have two armies down there. Maybe it's time to move Schuyler down there. So let's activate Schuyler and see if he moves south to rescue Lee. Rolling for his initiative. He gets it. So Schuyler is moving with a force of seven regulars. That's a respectable force. And he'll go down through Alexandria. So one, two, three, four. Down to Amelia. 
So we've got a very interesting campaign going on here in the south. And that ends the Action Pulse. Rolling for the next one. Action Pulse. The British go first. Okay. Well, the D marker will come off of Burgoyne. And we must look now to Cornwallis and Clinton. I think it's going to be Clint, uh, Cornwallis because he's an A-class leader. So I think he's going to move directly on now, either Schuyler or Lee. Schuyler is the better move. Cornwallis is going to move directly on to Schuyler. Now here's where the retreats before combat count. Because if Schuyler gets to retreat, um, well, Cornwallis is... Just chasing forces all over the board, which is ultimately not good for the British. Let's see what the Cornwallis gets for his initiative. He rolls. He gets a one, so he does have his initiative. Cornwallis goes one to Smith's Ferry, two to Lunenburg, and three onto Amelia. Now, Schuyler can accept battle. Let's see what the odds are. Schuyler would be on the seven table, adding one. And Cornwallis would be on a better table, eight to 14, and adding three. So it really doesn't make a lot of sense for Schuyler to fight when he doesn't have to. So he will roll for retreat before combat. He rolls, and he gets his initiative. So once again, the battle eludes Cornwallis. Schuyler retreats to Amelia. Now, uh, Cornwallis left Cross Creek. So there's one, two, three. He's got one moving point left. So he can go into Virginia. Whoops, we got a new rule here. Yep, we do. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, we got a real mess here. A real mess. Okay. When Cornwallis moved into Lunenburg, triggers regional militia, the whole middle states. So we have to pause and roll for the regional militia in the middle states. This is going to get real ugly. We're rolling for regional militia in the middle states region, or pardon me, the Tidewater region. Now the British hope that the colonials get a zero here. No militia, because, uh, well, it's going to get ugly. So here we go, rolling for a militia. Well, now we know the fates are against the British. The colonials, or Americans, get full SP in the tide water, and that's going to be really ugly. They get four in Maryland, so I'll put them at Baltimore. And they get two in Delaware, Militia, up here, Wilmington. And they get six in Virginia, which they have to split up into a four and a two. So a four and a two. Now, keeping in mind, I could have had those Militia come right on where Cornwallis was, which would have changed things. But I don't think the militia wanted to get stomped for free by Cornwallis, so we'll deploy them in a logical place. We'll put four with Schuyler and two more at uh, Fredericksburg. So that's the real situation now when Cornwallis has his one movement point left. Well... Cornwallis is going to be extra bold. This may be a mistake, but again, we're almost simulating the Guilford Courthouse campaign, aren't we? So, let's do the math. Scarlet can only command 10, so he's, on, he's going to be on the 10 table. Cornwallis would be on the 8 table. 
They'd both be on the same table, actually. Gotcha for rule 11.4. That's the leadership and what they can command. Uh, Skylar can technically command only 10. And there's 11 there. And the rule says that when you exceed your maximum, you can take half of the excess, which is, in this case, 1. And that won't change the table at all. So standard... Uh, Skyler is going to be on the 8 to 14 table, and Cornwallis will be on the um, 8 table, the same table. Cornwallis will be adding 3 to the dice because of his ability, and uh, Skyler will be adding uh, 1 to the dice. So, in that small margin of error, of guac, if you want to call it, Cornwallis has a chance to defeat Skyler at Richmond. It's all going to depend on the dice. So we're going to roll now. And two dice. Both parties are on the 8 to 14 table. Again, here at the British need a little bit of luck. They should have it. They've got some good modifiers. But uh, the dice are fickle. Let's see. Probably not good enough. It's going to be close. Skylar rolls an eight in the end, in the long run, which is a one star result. Cornwallis rolls a seven, really a ten, which is a one two star. So by a hair, Cornwallis does defeat Skylar, much like at Guilford Courthouse. So we take one British off. We take one Continental off, and Skyler is defeated. Sort of a Pyrrhic victory, very much like what happened at Gilbert Courthouse. So, Skyler retreats from Richmond. He'll go up to Fredericksburg, gets rewarded with a D marker, and Cornwallis is at Richmond. Kind of a Pyrrhic victory. So with that, it's now the colonial turn. Okay, Skylar will be able to remove the D marker. And now Charles Lee has an opportunity to strike Cornwallis a mortal blow. Cornwallis has really extended himself. Yeah, he's got a supply line to the coast here at Norfolk and He's got a supply line to Tappahannock, but <clears throat> that's not a port. So he's in a potentially extremely dangerous situation. Very dangerous. Corn Lee could come up from the rear. If he could cut him off and defeat him, they'd have the first major victory. Whenever you have the opportunity to get a major victory, you've got to try for it. You've just got to try. So let's see how the dice are to... Lee. So he must state what he's going to do. And his stated move will be to Lunenburg, Amelia, Norfolk, and then Richmond. He won't quite isolate Cornwallis, but it's going to be bad enough. Let's see if Lee gets his initiative first. Roll the die. He does. Okay, we have now the makings of a potential disaster. Okay, Lee is going to move into Virginia. His first space will be Lunenburg. Now you might ask, well, why isn't he taking a militia with him? Well, he can't, because remember, the minute you move into a another state, you have to obey the militia maximums, and the militia maximum is already at its top amount for Virginia. So he's got to move with nine Continentals, which could be more than enough. He's going to go to Amelia and drop off a Continental. Then he's going to move to Norfolk and drop off a Continental. And then he's going to move on Cornwallis. Now that's still a risky move. It's a bold move. 
But if he happens to defeat Cornwallis, it could get ugly. Now, so that's one, two, one, no, pardon me, one, two, three, four. So that's his last moving point. Now, Cornwallis, of course, can retreat for combat. Now, if he retreats for combat to Tappahannock, he's putting himself into a Yorktown situation. Because back to the sea, and this time it's not even a port. So there'd be madness to retreat there. He could retreat into the interior here, Amherst, but he's going to be out of supply. So it's almost as if he's got to fight this battle and defeat Lee. So he chooses to fight the battle. So we've got a very important battle coming up here. Let's do the math. Okay, this is going to be a very interesting battle and a very important one. Charles Lee will be on the seven table, three to seven table. He'll be adding one for his ability and adding one for Morgan's. So he's adding two to the dice. Cornwallis is also on the seven table, three to seven, and he's adding three to the dice. So it's a very equal contest, and it's going to be very, very decisive. It's taking place at Richmond. So if Cornwallis has to retreat, he's going to be in bad trouble because he's going to be isolated. So this is one important battle. Let's see how it goes. Three to seven table for both parties. Okay. Cornwallis may have it just by a hair. Okay, Cornwallis rolled a native seven and he's adding three. So he's really rolled a ten which is a one-star result. Lee has rolled a native six and adding one. He has rolled a seven, which is a one result. So by a hair, Cornwallis pulls it off. The Continentals lose one, and Cornwallis loses one. So Lee has to retreat from Richmond, back to Norfolk. He's got a D marker. And Cornwallis wins the battle at Richmond. But, as we see, he's isolated. Anyway, he's got enemy forces at Norfolk. Tap Tappahannock is a dead end. So, he's out of supply. Okay, I want to be very clear in what's happened here. So Cornwallis' line of communications is cut because he's at Richmond and he just doesn't have a line of communications. That's not good. And Lee is back here with just a D marker. He's fine. So, and that was the end of the action pose. This is why the initiative is so important. We're going to be doing rolling for the next action pose. And the rules are in your own action pulse, Cornwallis's action pulse, he must restore a line of communications or he surrenders. There's your Burgoyne and Saratoga situation. And that's a six. All you need is a five. So if Cornwallis surrenders, the Americans have their first major victory. So a lot is riding on these dice rolls now. For example, let's see who moves first. Who has the first action pulse this turn? Rolling. The British have it, which may save Cornwallis. And I say may, because Cornwallis is in a desperate situation. He's got to reestablish his line of communications or surrender. Now, I think he can because... He's got a six, and he can get out through the back door, I suppose. Could go one, two, three, four, and be reestablished. Of course, it depends then on his movement, too, doesn't it? He's got to roll a successful move. So there's lots happening here. Or he could fight a battle at Amelia and clear out that one continental. But you must state your objective your final square before you roll the die. 
So, if he clears out Amelia, he'll have a um, LOC. Even if he fails his rule or roll, he'll have one moving point. I think that's probably the best way than trying this long about route to the west. Although, there's something to be said for it. One, two, three, four, Fort Bernard, and he'd be closer to Clinton. But if he fails his movement roll, he'll only end up two movement points and end up at Taylorsville, which won't solve anything. So I'm afraid he's going to have to go for the Battle at Amelia. Okay, he rolls for his initiative. Does he get it? He does. So Cornwallis will immediately move on Amelia. Well, there's little chance of uh, Cornwallis losing this battle. When you have your line of communications cut, you fight the battle on one table lower than normal. So, while normally uh, Cornwallis is on the 3 to 7 table, he would actually be on the 2 table. Although he is adding um, 3 for the odds and 3 for his ability. So he's adding 6 to the dice on the 2 table, while the Americans would be rolling on the 1. Now, Normally, you know, ones usually retreat before sixes, but this battle is so darn critical, I think the Continentals here should go down fighting. So we're going to roll the die, and um, though it's stacked against the Continental here, with insane luck, they might be able to pull it off. So let's roll. Americans are on the one table, adding nothing, and Cornwallis is on the two table, adding six. Okay. Cornwallis rolls a base seven. He's adding six. So he's got a one result, destroying the Continental. The Continental was on the one table, and he rolled five, which was just a star. So the Continental is destroyed. And Cornwallis has reestablished his supply route. Lunenburg, Halifax, Albemarle Sound to the coast. So that LOC marker comes off. But it could have been very close. Oh, it was close. Okay, the D marker comes off of Charles Lee. It's the colonial or American action pulse. And he's going to go after Cornwallis with a vengeance. He can't quite cut him off the way he did before. One, two, three, four. Can't quite, but he just wants to defeat him in battle. Of course, Cornwallis might be able to retreat too. Let's see if uh, Lee gets his initiative. Rolls a die. He does. So Charles Lee goes one to Cornwallis and wants to engage. Cornwallis now has had the devil scared out of him. Six. God, he can still win the battle. Hmm. Nah, let's let him retreat too. Cornwallis will roll for his initiative. And he gets it, so he retreats to Lunenburg. Lee will pursue. Cornwallis will try to retreat again. He does. Retreats to Halifax. Charles Lee pursues. Cornwallis will try to retreat again. He does not. There we go. So now we have a battle at Halifax. Little town in North Carolina. Doing the math. Lee will be on the seven table, adding two. Seven table, adding two. Cornwallis will be on the six table, same table actually, adding three. And away we go. All the dice for the battle at Halifax. And Cornwallis will take it. He rolled an 11 which is one star. And Charles Lee got a six, which is just three stars. 
which is just not enough to even hurt Cornwallis. So, Charles Lee uses a continental and has to retreat from Halifax. So, Cornwallis, even as he retreats, is still pretty deadly. And he's marked with a D marker. Okay, we're rolling for the last initiative of the turn. Who moves first? The British again move first. Last action pulse. That's quite a campaign there in the south. Okay, while Lee has a D marker on him, it's time to hit him. This time it's have, we'll have Clinton do the battle. Clinton will advance directly onto Lee. Let's roll to see if he gets his initiative. He does. So he gets one to Tura, two to Fort Bernard, three to Smith's Ferry, and his last boot point to Lunenburg. Of course, Lee will try to retreat for combat. If he does, then he eludes Clinton's force. He rolls, and he gets his initiative, which means he can retreat to Amelia. And once again, victory eludes the British. So the last action pulse of the entire turn will be the Colonials. What can they do? The logical move is to activate Skylar, joining Lee and making Lee a 10. So let's try that. Skylar, he moves. So he pulls in four strength points. Lee, whoops, he won't be able to move all of them. Yes, he will. 10. So Charles Lee will make him the senior commander. They're both the same. And he's at Amelia. We've got a stalemate now in the south again. Stalemates are not good for the British. So that ends the early summer turn of 1777. Now it might be time here for an evaluation of what's going on on the board. Okay, I think with the number of turns I've done, you've probably seen enough of how the game works. I've always said that the game is really two games, prior to French entry and after French entry. A friend of mine has said, Gil, actually it's um, more like four games. You've got the before the French entry and after the French entry, as you said. Then there's the North uh, game, which is entirely different than the game in the South. And of course, you've got a whole sub-game going on in the Caribbean, which we haven't seen yet. That only happens when the French come in. So, the game is showing what I wanted to show. That for the British, it's a long haul. They have to bring their forces to bear, and when they bring them to bear, the Americans can retreat. If they're successful, successful they can just trade space for time, leaving the British sort of hanging out there. When the British try to occupy territory, the Americans can strike back and take it. Take it back, depriving them of victory. What's the key to British victory? I don't know. I wrote the victory conditions um, in such a way that the British can win, but it's very, very difficult to achieve. I'm wondering now if that coastal strategy is not the best, where the British take coastal cities and eventually rack them up and maybe win the game only after French entry. But that's going to be tough. Let me tell you, once the French get in, it gets really bad. So I'll probably end this video because we've got, what, seven volumes of moves here. Um, I think I'll do a, another video in the future um, showing you uh, the scenario when the French are in. Because when the French are in, you've got French fleets moving all over the place, naval combat. Uh, it gets pretty interesting. Interesting in a different way. Do I think the British can win? Not really. I don't really think they can win once the French are in. But you never know. The dice are fickle. Here I think the dice favored the Colonials or the Americans. Uh, the British didn't get the best sea moves. Um, some key battles were exchanges. But I can't blame it all on luck. There's some skill there. Plus, uh, you know, I'm playing by myself. Playing both sides. I'm seeing cards I'm not supposed to see. That would change things. So, I hope these videos were 
instructional. They taught you something about the game. And with that, I'll end this video. Seems a shame to not see what happens to this campaign in the South, but man, I really think the British are against the wall here. How many uh, factors do they have? They've got uh, 10 factors there, and Cornwallis has six. So we've got sort of like a disposable army of, you know, 16 or so. And here we've got 10 and more coming up, still militia. And the British have not nailed down South Carolina. In fact, they've lost South Carolina, haven't they? They don't have Serraro garrisoned, which means the political marker will change and the whole South is becoming unstuck, as it did in real life. So, anyway, that's the tutorials for War for America. I hope you enjoyed them. And uh, again, uh, thank you for watching.